I was so not a New Yorker, and I was working with people who were. I was, speaking of being out of my depth, I was way out. New York was just a horrifying place to me. I'd stay in my apartment. People in the staff would say, we go out here. We go out at night. We eat at 8 or 9 or 10 p.m. You got to go, you got to get out. I was in bed with a migraine. Um, I did not cotton to the whole New York lifestyle, and I have a terrible memory for numbers. So I didn't know Fifth Avenue from 64th Street. I, d I didn't know where I was. My only landmark was that I was living in a tall high rise directly across the street from Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center, that's all I knew. Um, I remember Murray, who was my beau at that point, we were not yet married, drew me a little map with Central Park in the middle. He didn't know New York much better than I did, but he knew enough. And I followed that map when I had to go out grocery shopping and stuff. And if I turned east or west, I had to turn the map. I, I was hopeless in New York, hopeless. And kept to myself. Well, you don't keep to yourself in New York. Certainly not if you're on the cover of magazines, and I was. I was supposed to be the girl who would knock Barbara Walters off the air. That was one of the headlines in the magazine. Well, you see how that went. So I was supposed to be out there grabbing the brass ring, and I was cowering in this apartment that I had rented uh, and hurting. My head was hurting. I would lean over, throw up in a bucket during the commercial, and get back up and continue the show. I couldn't think. I could not think. And having been hired to write my own material, when I got to New York, I found they were not letting me write my own material. In fact, one of the writers hired for AM America was Tom Meehan, the fellow who happened in the office right next door to mine with cigarette smoke curling from underneath his closed door. Tom Meehan was writing Annie while he was supposed to be writing for AM America. I doubt he would have minded my telling that story. It turned out wonderfully for him. You see, that's the thing. He knew how to use that time. He knew how to fight the fight. He got the job. He'd turn in something for the next day's AM America, which it was called at that point. But what he was really doing in his office, right next to mine, was writing Annie. I just sat in my office in a daze and would find little memos in the file folder saying, no need to tell Stephanie about this decision, wouldn't want to alarm her. I had become kind of the, the person to avoid. Stephanie's too serious. She's too worried about the content of the pieces. She's not having any fun. Well, there was nothing to have fun with, really, you see. So I didn't fight. I didn't. At least I didn't fight in a way that, that developed a power base. Peter Jennings, who was our newsman out of Washington, took the train up one day from Washington and said, I need to see you for dinner tonight. Meet me so and so and such and such. I, bleary-eyed from migraine, meet Peter Jennings. Peter said, Stephanie, you've got to save the show. I've got to stay? What, what are you talking about? He said, well, you're the woman. And over the years, I've thought about exactly what it was he was, he, he was saying to me then. In a way, what he was saying, beyond the obvious, you know, use your sexual wiles, whatever they might have been, and they were minimal. Beyond that, he was saying, because you are a woman, you have some power by being unpredictable, eccentric, grabbing some headlines, everybody's looking at you, they're wondering if you can compete with Barbara Walters, use it. They need to keep you here. I didn't, I could not grasp that. And I, I basically said, Peter, I'm doing the best I can and nobody's listening to me. Oh, he was impatient. He said, you don't know how to use your, your power. And I didn't. And I have never really known how to use it. When I, I, when I guess I had it on various shows that came and went, I've never been very good at using power. So having worked as many years as I have, I have to say I've been blessed. I've been very lucky to work all these years without having the aggressive crust that you usually need to have as the 
as the bottom line of however you're going to make a career work. By then, I think ABC would have been happy to see me go. They just had to figure out a way to get rid of me. It was Peter who, on his own, saw the catastrophe that the show was. And Peter had a very strong ego. He didn't want to be involved with a joke. And AM America, as it started out, was a joke. It was a joke. I left in May, but the entire group was gone by October. And they redesigned it. And it was at that point that it became Good Morning America. Did you have any kind of relationship with Peter Jennings after the initial contact? No. Uh, he knew I was planning to get married. He knew we were going to go to Scotland. I was leaving the show in the middle of May, and uh, we were going to be married in L.A. in June and go to Scotland. Peter called and said, left a message with our secretary, I have some advice for Stephanie about where to go in Scotland and what to do and so on. And uh, I left the message back with his secretary, thanks, please thank Peter for me, but we've already got our itinerary planned. At which he responded through the secretary, tell her to go to hell, which is the last word I ever heard from Peter Jennings. Wow. Yeah. He had, if I had had a, a, an iota of the ego that Peter Jennings had, I, I would have had a different career. And I look back on Peter and the good work that he did and, and how he headed uh, network news operations in various places all over the world, Beirut among them, London among them. He was Canadian, Peter was. And I realized you've got to have a certain amount of ego to gain the power and the respect you need in order to carry your work forward. He was good at that, I was not.